All the people turned their backs to the land and looked at the sea all day. And as long as it took to pass, the ship kept raising its hull, reflected in the sand a standing goal. But whatever the truth may be, the water comes to the land. But when has that been any bar to any watch thy keep? Robert Frost. And it's true, we as human beings are attracted to the chaotic sound of the sea. Not the random sound, the chaotic sound. Chaos means a pattern too big to hold in our minds. Our goal, as we start to explore the NLP, is can we stretch our minds to hold some of those chaotic patterns of human communication? Two rows diverged, and I, I took the one less trodden by. That has made all the difference. And it's true, as popular as NLP is into this day and age, there's still so many people that haven't come across it that it could be the difference that makes the difference for you. Hello, my name is John Cashier Rice. I'm the host for this training and the founder of the NLP, Professional NLP Practitioner. We have covered a lot so far in this video lessons. So this week, we, last few weeks, we've been exploring the unconscious mind. Now we're going to start to explore communication. Multiple different ways we could explore communication. NLP is famous for the rapport building, matching, mirroring, crossover mirroring. And I thought today we might do something a little bit different. Let's look, we've been exploring the brain and how our, what's going on between our ears affects our behavior in day to day life. Let's carry that on through communication. So we're going to explore the surface of the left hemisphere of the brain and how it affects communication. If you've ever had a situation where you've asked somebody to do something and they seem to acknowledge you and yet not follow through or even just to hold somebody's attention what, and you can't seem to do that, whether that's your children, boss, people you work with, marketing, many applications. That's right. So let's explore it from the left hemisphere of the brain. Why the left hemisphere rather than the right hemisphere? because the left hemisphere contains the language centers. On the right hemisphere, pretty much looks the same from a structural point of view, but contains no language centers. So, you should see a screen now come up with a map of the brain. Right, there it is. So, if you want somebody to make a decision on what you've just asked them, that message needs to arrive at the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is where you make your decisions. Just behind that resides work in memory, but it's also where we coordinate our bodies. Uh, so if I decide that I'm going to advance a slide with my finger, which you'll see the advanced slide in, I need to coordinate my body to be able to do that. Connected to that is initiation of action. So if I make a decision, prefrontal cortex, to press the button, I need to coordinate my body. I now initiated that action, and if everything goes well, you'll see the next slide advance. Yay, I'm always pleased when that works. Now connected to that is tactile sensations. So if I feel the cotton of my shirt, that information is fed up my arm, is processed in that part of the brain. Just behind that is imagination. I'm using the word imagination very precisely. Imagination means all the senses and not just visualization. So when you're daydreaming, and I do realize that every now and again, which is outrageous, you've been daydreaming while you've been watching these videos. I know, I know you're doing it. This part of the brain lights up. It's also if somebody takes you on a guided visualization. This part of the brain also tends to light up. Now, right at the back, we see visual the furthest point away from the prefrontal cortex. Next we see visual memory, which feeds into mental images. Please have a challenge with eyewitnesses, because not all eyewitnesses can agree on what they saw. The reason being is short-term iconic memory, short-term iconic memory. Iconic just means visual. So short-term visual memory only lasts for one second before it gets wiped clean. So by the time you realize how important it is to remember what you've just seen, it's already left your short-term memory and your imagination fills in the blanks of what you think you saw. 
Visual information has been up updated one tenth of a second constantly. That's huge, and that's why it clears it every second. Sound. Sound is seductive to us as human beings. Stephen Pinkner says we are uniquely gifted to make complex meaning from sound. Sound is the first sense to develop in the womb. It's on 24 hours a day, even when you're sleeping, you're monitoring all the sound around you. It's the last sense you lose just before you die. Sound is intrusive, and you know it's intrusive because if you're dri driving along and you get into a place where you need to concentrate to find somewhere new, you always turn the radio down or off. They spent a fortune to sound find out where sound is processed and it was just above the ear. I know. <laughs> All eyewitnesses agree on what they heard. The reason being is short-term iconic memory, short-term iconic memory. Rattles around for up to five seconds and iconic just means auditory. So short-term auditory memory rattles around for up to five seconds, I think I just said minutes, but it's seconds, before it gets wiped clean. This is why when you're at school and you were daydreaming and the teacher picked on you and said, what did, you, did I just say? And you said, oh, you said this. And the teacher says, oh, how did you know? And you're thinking, you're sitting there, goes, I didn't know, I was daydreaming. And that's because you could retrieve it from your short-term memory. So if you get getting caught out on that, stop speaking for five seconds and then say to somebody, what did I just say? And you'll get the true response because they go, I don't know, I wasn't listening. Right. Here's what I want to talk about is the language centers. In Germany, Karl Vornicke discovered Vornicke's area and it names things. So it processes nouns. So if on my palm I've got a ball of fluff, it's got whiskers and it's purring. This part of the brain goes kitten. So it names things. Five years later in France, Broca discovered Broca's area. Broca area is inside that green section of the brain which we talked about, to, co coordination of action, etc. So part of Broca's particular job to do is to coordinate my diaphragm, my throat, my tongue and my mouth so that I can speak. It also processes verbs. Why is it important to know Broca processes verbs? Because Broca is the gatekeeper to the prefrontal cortex. Yes, there's an update little gatekeeper monitoring anything anyone ever says. And if you're predictable, have you heard it before? Broca says, I'm switching off. That message is going nowhere near the prefrontal cortex. So if you've got children and you suspect they stop listening to you, it's because Broca areas going, ah, oh, mum and dad always says this, we don't need to pay attention. If you go into work and you say the same things and do the same thing, people stop paying attention to you, broker switches off. So as soon as you're predictable, if I tell you a joke and you can predict the end of it, you stop listening. Two men walk into a bar, ooh, ah. Jokes work because they're unpredictable. Unless you knew what was happening and then broker went, oh, I'm switching off. So. If we were to start to explore great communicators, people who keep their message in our minds, where would we go? Well, marketing and advertising. Look at what they meant to do is cut through all the clutter and get their message through. So where do the great marketers and advertisers go to get their insights? Normally into neuroscience. Wow. So I also think if we want to master this communication skill and have people remember what we say and act upon what we say, then it might be useful to understand a little bit about memory. So Dr. Alan Badley, who used to be at Cambridge University, now resides at York University, has a wonderful book out on memory and it is called Your Memory. Yeah, and he has what he calls a learning equation. And the learning equation, I think, is also a communication equation. And also a marketing equation. So his equation is this, salience, salience. 
times repetition equals learning. What is salience? Salience is how important something is to you as an individual. For example, one of my children loves Manchester United. I know, what can you do? But he loves that football team. Highly, highly salient to him. He only has to hear who's playing, repetition, once or twice, and he can talk at me for hours of all the different possibilities that could happen because Arsenal's away, got an aggregate point, and it's all very mathematical, by the way. However, the times table has low salience, which means we have to do huge amounts of repetition to get the same learning. Salience, say something that's surprising and important, and you can bypass all of this. But let's, we'll get to that in a moment. So salience, how important it is. So when we're communicating, do you think sometimes something's really important to us? So we only have to hear it once or twice, and we'll have it. Other times, we have low salience, so repetition works. So let's put that into a context. Let's say first thing in the morning, you say to your partner, who's about to go off to work, who's just had their breakfast, can you pick up the milk? They're gonna say yes. Okay, so at that point in the morning, how salient, how important is milk to them? They're about to go off for work and they've had, already had their breakfast. I would suggest that's low salience. How many times have they heard it, once or lots? It's once, isn't it? That equals no milk. So could you increase the salience of the milk? You might say to them, we're gonna have custard tonight, pick up the milk. For some people, Custard is important. If that doesn't work, increase the repetition. So, they've heard it once. Three times is about the minimum we're after here. So about 10, 10, 30 in the morning, as you often do, you call them up and say, I'm just thinking of you all lovey-dovey. Pick the milk up. Then, in the afternoon, you might text them and say, oh, just to let you know, I'm running late, have you remembered the milk? They'll be a bit shirty with you, to be fair. I know, yes, I remember the milk. They hadn't. But at least you'll have the milk now. Now, some of you might say, isn't that just nagging? Well, here's the thing, nagging works. <laughs> but you don't have to do it nagging-wise. You can use repetition in ways that engage people. But we often get scared of using repetition. We've said something once and we think someone's got it. And yet, it wasn't salient to them and it wasn't important to them. And you've had this happen to you at work. Something's been highly salient to you. And we have to remember, just because something is salient to you doesn't mean it's gonna be salient to other people. So you say to someone, can you do this for me? And they say, yes. And you think to yourself, right, that's taken care of and you're on to the next thing. Well, you come back to say, have you done it? And they say, well, no, I've got a list of other things to do. You say, but it's really important. And they'll go, yeah, but it's not important to me. So increase the salience or increase the repetition to get that message through. You can bypass all of that by surprising broker, the light broker, and you'll have the yellow brick road to the prefrontal cortex. Now, a lot of marketers and advertisers kind of get this. And what they end up doing is entertaining rather than marketing, i.e. getting their message through. So, has anybody ever said to you, did you see that advert on TV last night? It was so funny. Here's the test to see whether that person is marketing or that company is marketing or advertising. Say, name the company. If they can't name the company or the product, then it doesn't matter what awards that advert wins. It hasn't done its job. You must connect the surprise to the product or the company. So let's test an advert. This will only work if you're in the UK. And this advert, oh, it might work in other places, but I'll kind of warn you, this is a, a UK example. Let's test this advert. Hasn't been on the UK TV for about 10 years. But about 40 to 50% of people listening to this will still remember the product. Okay, let's test it. Now, some of you are gonna go, I'm not sure just what he just said there but you can look it up online. Who knew? Who knew somebody dressed in a gorilla's outfit 
playing the drums. So Phil Collins, of all people, would be attached to Cadbury's Dairy's Milk Chocolate. Who knew that? Now, like I said, if you haven't seen that advert, it makes no sense to you. But some of you haven't seen it for nearly a decade, and yet, by the time I said drums, you knew exactly what I was talking about. The surprise broker got their message through. So, when you have to communicate with somebody and you need them to remember what you've just said, your message needs to stand out from all the clutter, and that's the principle that drives that. So if I said to you, we, can I have a 17 minute meeting with you? You can go, 17 minutes? That's a bit odd and very precise. But out of all your meetings that day, whose meeting's gonna stand out? That's right, my one. If I said, oh, can we meet at two minutes past six? You go, well, that's a bit precise. It surprises broker, it delights broker, and I get my message through. But here's the thing. What if I always did that? I would become predictable. And it's not about just being random. We need to make sure the surprise is connected and that we don't overuse it. So in this video lesson, we have covered a lot. Some core concepts that you may not come across anywhere else about communicating, getting our message across. Now, the precursor to all of this is you have rapport and connection with the person or people, um, some sort of relationship, and you know what your goal of your message is. But we talked about the brain in various different ways. We talked about the prefrontal cortex being the decision maker, and that if we can get our message through to the prefrontal cortex, people are more likely to act on what we've just asked them. So several tools we had there was salience, i.e. is it important to them? If it's very important, we're gonna get our message through. But if it's not, repetition, we can increase repetition. But if those, we don't have time for repetition. We can surprise broker, delight broker, and have the yellow brick road to the prefrontal cortex. So, are you aware of just how valuable this information can be when you're designing any communication in any situation? Wow, we've certainly been steaming ahead. So next week, we're gonna switch tactics again and start to explore storytelling and just how powerful and potential of storytelling can be in all walks of life. It's one not to miss. And also, I'll talk about an opportunity of engaging in some live NLP training. So, got any questions? Put them below, and I'll get back to you, or any comments of how you've been using this. Also, if it's personal, as always, you can email me directly at john at nlpcourses.com. Have an outrageous week. Have a fabulous week. Until then, see you soon.